I want to welcome you to the uh, Whale Sanctuary Project live series. And today we are uh, honored to be able to talk with my good friend and colleague, Denise Herzing. Dr. Denise Herzing is the founder and the director of the Wild Dolphin Project, as you know, and this is a project that has been going on for 32 years now in the Bahamas, studying Atlantic spotted dolphins. Uh, Dr. Herzing is a 2008 Guggenheim Fellow, a fellow with the Explorers Club, a scientific advisor for the American Cetacean Society, and uh, I'm very proud to say an advisor for the Whale Sanctuary Project. And she is a board member of Schoolyard Films, and she has uh, a ton of scientific articles, peer-reviewed articles out, and has also co-edited a book called Dolphin Communication and Cognition that I was very fortunate to contribute to. And Dolphin Diaries, my 25 years with spotted dolphins in the Bahamas. So I would like to welcome uh, Denise Herzing uh, to the webinar. So what, what we'd like to do now, uh, Denise, is I'd like to invite you to share your screen to uh, provide some background as to uh, the research you've been doing, show us some really cool slides, and then you can stop sharing your screen and we'll be back in in conversation. So um, I work with Atlantic Spotted Dolphins in the Bahamas, and as Lori said, for uh, over 35 years now, actually. Mm. And they're a really nice species to study. I was lucky that way because they get uh, spots with age, so you can tell their basic age class. Now, we do use kind of traditional techniques of dorsal fin ID, but we use their spots to identify them. For example, um, the older, darker animal you see up here is Muggsy. Is in this shot, she's actually 35 years old. So that's the kind of degree of spotting they get with age. And I, I chose the Bahamas primarily um, because I wanted to work underwater and I really wanted to see how dolphins communicated underwater and over generations. So uh, I kind of settled in the Bahamas. We work non-invasively, so we have to being too invasive. And we're on our fourth generation now, which is great. And my primary tool uh, started and continues to be an underwater uh, video with a hydrophone. So we get sound and behavior simultaneously. Now, the Bahamas is just off the coast of Florida here on the left, and um, we work on the primarily on the northernmost sand bank called Little Bahama Bank. You see uh, on the top there, I guess I can point to it even, um, in this area. And we also work at a second study site now across this deep water uh, in Bimini, which is, this is a great Bahama bank. So the Bahamas is a pretty neat archipelago of submerged islands, so all the light-colored area are uh, very shallow waters, anywhere from 10 to 20 feet. And, and it provides a pretty safe place, not only for dolphins, but for uh, field researchers. Um, Profit, the Wild Dolphin Project, has a beautiful 60-foot catamaran that actually got donated to the project early on. And so this is our live aboard uh, lab for about five months every summer. We eat, sleep, do our work from this vessel. Uh, so we're really a uh, live aboard uh, vessel and we're we work pretty remotely, so we can be 40 miles offshore easily for our uh, studies. Now, you know, dolphins are, spotted dolphins are kind of like bottlenose in the same uh, life history sense. So they nurse for three to four years. The mother has a calf every three to four years. And this is the strongest dent in the first year. Um, so that's very mammalian, it turns out. And pregnancies, they're pregnant for about a year, and, then, and like I said, they have a three to four year calving interval. So this is the basic uh, biology we can track following them, and it gives you these neat family trees, as you see here. Uh, this is a family tree of blotches, a female that um, was already there, and you can see she's got quite a family line. Uh, not everybody survived here, but uh, we actually have quite a, a few calves and uh, and grandkids from blotches. So some females are better reproducers than others. Now, one thing we've learned just about the general society is that, whoops, uh, let me go back here, that females associate by reproductive status. So you see Little Gash and Rose Mole here, the two more mature animals with spots. They were uh, 
close buddies as juveniles growing up. And then Rosemold got pregnant before Little Gash did, so she started hanging out with other females. And gradually, Little Gash caught up to her, reproduced uh, her first offspring, Little Haley, and then they started associating again. So a female can actually uh, change her associations based on her reproductive status. And we want to find out who the fathers are, so we non-invasively collect their uh, DNA by grabbing, scooping poop in the water. This is a favorite job of my graduate students. <laughs> and after you uh, take samples of their fecal material and, and match it with, and what we found basically is the older males are the ones that sire the most offspring. So they seem to be most successful in uh, paternity. And this is really the only way to find out paternity. Now males, turns out are really lifelong friends. They form their bonds when they're juveniles. And um, these are strong bonds that last a lifetime. They hang out in small coalitions of two or three, maybe four. And they have kind of a different job than the females. They tend to protect the, the pod. They pretend to, I mean, they protect the uh, area that the nursery groups are in, for example. So they have different roles in the society and uh, different structures this way. Now, one of the very cool things about working in the Bahamas, which I didn't really anticipate or expect, was that bottlenose dolphins lived in the same area, and that sometimes they forage together with the spotted, although that's a small percentage of the time. Uh, young spotted females babysit bottlenose calves occasionally. Then the bottlenose have a bit of a dominance over the spotted. Um, they're a lot bigger and stronger, so they can bully uh, the spotted in their interactions. But in the end, the two species actually will form alliances when there's a mutual um, disturbance. So for example, if male bottlenose and spotted are fighting, they will join forces and chase that uh, a predator away that comes by, like a shark or even an offshore bottlenose, which is uh, not a resident. So that, that's actually been one of the most surprising things of the work and really cool to watch how intimate and regular their uh, interactions are. Now we know a lot about their sounds because we correlate them with behavior. So hopefully here you'll hear a signature whistle. Um, anyway, signature whistles are frequency modulated whistles. Let's see if you try that again. <laughs> well, those were burst pulse sounds uh, you hear. These are squawks. They're used in close proximity, usually fighting. Um, then they have echo echolocation clicks. These tend to be navigation, feeding, echolocation clicks, basically sonar. And then finally, you have um, buzzes, which are basically packets of clicks. These are used in courtship, discipline, and uh, they might have a tactile effect uh, with the dolphins, too. Let me see if I can maybe play that signature whistle again. Let me see if you hear this. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, yeah, well, all right. Great. My ear sets off. We'll just go from here. Okay, so those are <laughs> signals of a dolphin. Uh, I'll play the burst pulses for you here again. Um, <laughs> and so burst pulses are um, the most unstudied type of sound, but they're one of the more common types of sounds. We'll, we'll talk about that a little in the future here. Anyway, echolocation clicks and buzzes. Exactly. Okay, so those are signature whistles. Here we go. First pulse. So we hear those during fighting and aggression. Um, echolocation clicks we hear when they're hunting and digging in the sand. And then finally, packets of clicks, uh, which we call buzzes, that they use during courtship, during discipline, when a mother's disciplining a calf. And they're close proximity sounds, usually. Okay, got through them all. How about that? Good. So Great. I will just leave it set up like this. So the interesting thing about all these sounds is that we have known about signature whistles for over 40 years. Um, we know we can measure their contours visually, parametrically, all that, and we can use neural nets even to measure these sounds. But as you just saw, there's all sorts of other sounds that dolphins make that we really want to understand because they're more common even than um, whistles. 
Um, one of the things we have to keep in mind when we're looking at dolphin communication, of course, is that they're making sounds way above our hearing range. So on the bottom left, you see narrow band uh, whistles, which I just played for you. This is what we hear in the water, and everything else is what we don't hear above that. And you can see we have harmonics of the whistles on the right that are very high outside our hearing range. And in some cases, we don't even detect there's a presence of sound in the narrow band, as you see here in the middle. So again, having the right tools for any animal a study really is important because their sensory systems are, are different than ours. The other thing we need to think about when we're studying dolphin communication is who's making the sound. And this has been and still is a major challenge uh, for us as well as most other researchers. Uh, we've been working um, with a colleague in Singapore, Matthias hoffman kunt who's developed a uh, triangulation unit with video underwater for us. And this is one of the results it gives us is on the video screen, it would mark what animals are making sound. So the little red squares are all the dolphins that are echolocating. So this we could use finally to look at dolphin to dolphin communication, which is pretty exciting. Yes. Long, long in coming. <laughs> and hopefully we'll put it to use out in the Bahamas. But what we're doing with our 30 plus year data set of video and underwater sounds is we're really trying to take a really close look at do dolphins have something like language or language-like structures? So these are three spectrograms um, that you're looking at sounds. So basically what you're looking at is um, time on the horizontal and uh, frequency on the vertical. And this is what human speech looks like next to Einstein. And then you have prairie dogs who have, you know, interesting alarm calls that aren't dissimilar. And then finally you see dolphins. And so what we don't know is, is there really language in there somewhere in meeting? Are we just missing it? We're not understanding it. And some people will say, ah, we've looked at this already and blah, blah, blah. My view on it is we just have not had the tools. And now with machine learning and AI, we have some pretty serious tools to start parsing out these sounds and looking for structure and language. So that's one of the main um, things we've been working at. Okay, so I'm going to... I'm going to actually stop there, Lori. Okay, you can I'm stop sharing your screen. I'm going to let you take it, and then we can look at some videos if we have some time or great. questions. Great, terrific, you. terrific. That was great. Thank you. So that was really fascinating, and, and you just touched upon so many different things that I want to get into in, in the time that we have uh, today. Um, I mean, you started out talking about the fact that you chose to work in the field because you were really interested in following a whole society of dolphins over the generations. And that's something that obviously is not easy to do in a captive environment. Can you say anything more about you know, why, why you chose your approach to studying them? Sure. Well, you know, when I was a student, um, I was really just interested in what animals were thinking, like what's going on in their minds. Mm -hmm. And right at that time, honestly, Jane Goodall was out looking at chimps. Uh, Diane Fossey was uh, studying gorillas and Cynthia Moss was looking at elephants. And all these scientists were out there and their approach was clearly to plant themselves in a place where they could observe natural behavior and try to get the animals to trust them and be benign observers. So that was, that was really my major model for doing what I did. And luckily I was young and naive enough to know that it might be hard, but <laughs> I thought, well, what else have I got to do, right? I can get out well, there. Well, they don't do it underwater, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, that adds a, a whole other issue, of course. But yeah, and so I was lucky to find the Bahamas and my first year I went out there and I, I saw, I like, I was like, why isn't anyone out here studying these guys, right? Because you could get in the water and watch them. But clearly it's expensive, it's time consuming, and it takes a lot of detailed diligence like any scientific uh, project, really. So um, what's really unknown uh, when I talk about my work to people is that I spent about five years, the first five years, just on the boat anchored. And we let the dolphins just come to the boat because we are out there, there's 40, it's 40 miles offshore, we let them explore us and we would slip in the water when they came by and we'd start taking photos for photo ID and trying to sex them. But that was an issue in itself in the beginning because uh, of dolphin etiquette, uh, which we can talk about. It's kind of fun. Yes. But um, 
we, I really invested those first five years to establish that we weren't going to hurt them, we weren't going to harass them, we weren't going to grab them, touch them, and feed them, and all that stuff. And it really paid off. They finally started showing our us our natural their natural behavior. So that was a worthwhile investment. It absolutely is. And you know what I always say about studying these animals in their natural habitat. And I love your saying uh, on their own terms. In their like world. In the sure. world on their own terms, right. because it really is. And you're learning not about what they can do or learn if you train them to do something, but what they do do, what right. they choose to do. And that's so much more revealing in many ways. Yeah. You mentioned dolphin etiquette. I want to know, what is that? <laughs> tell, tell our listeners what that is. Well, my view on it, it's, it's, it's how you behave in the water with a species that you don't know. I mean, I learned a bit of the hard way. Uh, for example, in those early years when we were, we were anchored on, uh, on our boat, um, we would get in the water, like I said, and we'd try to get photos of the dolphins. And we really wanted to sex them, which means you have to get underneath them or they have to turn upside down so you see their general slits and all that. And so, uh, you know, we're anxious to get our data, right? So I, uh, one of the first times I tried it, you know, there was two, two dolphins swimming ahead of me. And so I turned upside down to look underneath them. And, and suddenly one dolphin kind of like moved away with the other and, and pushed the other away. And after a time, I realized, oh, that's a courtship gesture. That's <laughs> like, right. <laughs> that's what I mean, I kind of knew that, but like, certainly they know I'm a human, you know, but it yeah. was something they just didn't allow which was interesting. Um, mm -hmm. The other, so that was, I consider that a kind of an etiquette of being with uh, a dolphin. A faux pas, a dolphin faux pas. Faux pas, yeah, totally. I yeah. mean, they probably laughed, but. Yeah. Um, but another really interesting one was just following them in the water when there's a, a tight group. Again, I used to try to like, so I'd be in the back of this group of dolphins and, and I try to move to a different position to get a different side of an animal, you know, in a photograph. And they would reposition me. Go back to your place, human. <laughs> it, it's really, so, yeah. It, so those subtle things so, were like, oh, that's probably how they do it with each other, right? That you have a position in this little traveling pod, and that's your place. And I guess I was the weak little calf who couldn't swim. Like <laughs> they were drafting me. <laughs> the weird so. little dolphin who's not <laughs> that good in the water. <laughs> not as good yeah. as them. Yeah, and I, you know, I guess with any species, you learn what their signals are and exactly. their priorities, and you know, not you know, flailing in the water in our case or reaching out to grab them. You know, I mean, that's any etiquette really with a wild animal, I guess. But um, yeah, so that's what I call dolphin etiquette. That's wonderful. I mean, it's wonderful in so many ways because they seem to they're obviously aware of you and are trying to explain to you or show you. This is what you need to do if you want to hang out with us. Um, right. And you are respecting that, which is, which is just great. Um, you've talked about, you know, the fact you have a very unique situation there because you've got two species, spotted dolphins and bottlenose dolphins. And you right. talked about how they babysit for one another, that they form alliances. Were you surprised when you first saw this kind of yeah. interspecies cooperation? Yeah, the first time I, I saw it, I remember, I remember the encounter. It was a large group with both species, and the water was kind of murky, so I caught mm -hmm. some of it, and I was like, oh my gosh, I, the water's so murky, I'll never see this again. You know, I was very sad, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what is this confab of two species? But then we kept seeing it on a regular basis, and um, like about 15% of the time, when we see spotted, there are bottlenose with them doing something mm. together. So th the fact that they do these social things together, I mean, even pregnant females travel together sometimes of both species. S so, you know, I, I guess it's the, you know, you're safer knowing your neighbor and, and knowing who they are in case you have a problem, which they do with mutual predators sometimes. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. And I think it's a good example of how species can get along in the wild and adjust, you know, they overlap, they're sympatric, and they adjust their behavior. And um, that we do suspect they have some hybrids. And of mm. course, this has been reported around the world for many decades by many scientists. 
but because we're in the water and we've seen the cross mating and we've seen some examples and now we can actually look at it genetically, of course, to verify. But the fact that, you know, they really do socialize together and can have very intimate relationships and regular relationships. And um, one of the things though, you know, they really don't um, fight over food. They seem to have different foraging niches. It's really the mm. socializing that seems to be uh, what they spend most of their time doing together. That's, that's really interesting because it kind of reminds me of the resource partitioning that the orphans mm. do in the southern, in the uh, Pacific Northwest between the resident orcas and the transients, where uh, sometimes right. they're St. Patrick, you know, they're together, but one eats a very particular species of fish, Chinook, and the other eats mammals. And they have, they don't have that kind of close social relationship that the guys that you study have. They kind of avoid each other and they definitely don't mate, you know, with each other. Um, but it is, it is a way of working out how to live in the same area and not fight right. or compete for right. scarce resources. Right. Uh, so that, that's really very, very interesting um, that uh, the dolphins do that as well. Um, do you know that what you're seeing there at your site, Denise, is um, what, what aspects are unique to the site uh, or the society of dolphins that you're studying? And uh, what are the things that others have reported elsewhere, in term, especially in terms of interspecies interactions? Yeah, I mean, uh, they aren't studied a lot of places in the world. They're, you know, yeah. endemic to the Atlantic only. Uh, there's a study down at Venezuela. I know they've observed the two species together. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, our second study site, which we're spending more time at now just because of climate change displacement, which is another whole topic. Yeah, um, we didn't get into that. Yeah, but our uh, first study site, we certainly saw this regular behavior I just described. Um, then we had a couple hurricanes hit in 2004 and five, and we had pretty big losses of both species. And all of a sudden we weren't seeing any interaction between the species. Their behavior was completely destabilized for about four years until they got normalized again. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. So yeah, so that had a big amp impact on their uh, social behavior. And then in the second study site, when we started going down there and watching, we'd been down there some in the winters, but uh, in the summers now, we go down there more so, and they do interact down there as well. So I think it's just part, just the ecology uh, allows, you know, a certain amount of spotted and bottlenose to use the habitat, as long as they eat differently in different locations and different species. I mean, there's some overlap. So for example, the spotted, they go offshore at night off this deep water edge of the shallow sand bank, and they are hunting flying fish and squid all night, basically. And we've never seen a bottlenose out there at night, exactly. ever, ever, ever. Yeah. The bottlenose eat in the grass beds. They're digging out deep eel. Um, yeah, so they definitely separate their, their feeding a lot. And have you seen, um, you've seen hybrids. Are they reproductively, reproductively viable? Or? Well, we don't, we don't know yet. We have visual <laughs> suspicions of hybrids, and we're still yeah. trying to work out the genetic yeah. process protocols to verify it but yeah it's probably more common than we think I think yeah yeah um let's talk about climate change because that's obviously something that we're all experiencing right now and unfortunately so many species and groups of animals are feeling the effects and having to change their behavior because of it what have you seen in, in the society that you've been studying? Well, besides the hurricanes I just mentioned, where we lost yeah. about 30% of both species, um, just in oh. 2013, not so long ago, um, basically half of our resident spotted dolphins that we've been studying for 28 years suddenly moved 100 miles away. They crossed the deep water uh, to an, the next sandbank, which is now another study site of ours on a regular basis. and we started wondering what was going on. Like why would a group of resident dolphins who had this beautiful life, remote, you know, no people, just fish and pretty water. Why would they move? And we started um, getting some data from NOAA. So we started looking at uh, chlorophyll levels basically from satellite imagery. And 
it was pretty clear after looking at different uh, onshore, offshore uh, places that the chlorophyll level, which is a proxy for plankton, right, which again goes up the food chain, had just crashed, like crashed mm -hmm. right where the dolphins were living. So our best guess is that the food chain crashed. We kind of noticed it anecdotally, but we didn't have any good measures of it. You know, we noticed we'd go out at night to watch them feed at night and there wouldn't be any prey. It was like, where's all the flying fish and squid? So something crashed. We don't know why. Um, either nutrients or changes in wind direction, we're not sure. Um, Unfortunately, it looks like that's happening all over the Bahamas now. We've looked at some recent data and it doesn't look good again. So, you know, these animals are being pressured for the one thing they really need, which is food, right? So mm -hmm. you got to put the food. The reason they've been resident probably is they live on the sandbank and they have resources that don't move, migrate, like fish along, along the east coast of Florida, for example, the dolphins probably follow these fish schools. In the Bahamas, they had a the grocery store was there all the time. And so they could stay resident so it's and it's pushing one group of dolphins into another resident group of dolphins so now they have to figure out that dance right like how do you right exactly when a bunch of dolphins move in right so we've been also monitoring that it's interesting um the so domino yeah, it's effect you know in some sense right because you have effects that immediate and then way down over there, you know, because of all these links. Yeah, yeah. It's pressuring animals to move closer, you know, between groups, not just dolphins, I think a lot of animals probably, right? So yeah, what we've done with the climate's pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we need to do something about that, um, for sure. But of course, we don't quite know what to do. Um, but something has to be done drastically and quickly because, yeah. as you said, these animals are being impacted all the time and the impacts just reverberate throughout the ecosystems and go further and further out. And so you don't always know the full impact, right, of the effects of well, climate change or anything, noise pollution, chemical right. pollution. It's just like circular rings that go out from there. And honestly, Lori, I think it's an extra challenge because look how hard it is to do long-term research, yeah. right? It's challenging with time, with money. Uh, and imagine what we're missing. I mean, we're one of the best places to watch dolphins in the world. And exactly. we're still, we are out there for eight months of the year. We don't know what goes on in the, you know, we miss all this stuff, even though we have good data and good baseline. And so imagine that happening all around the world it's, it's exactly just so frustrating it's very frustrating and we talk about you know cultures and cultures being lost um before we even come to know them uh right. and so and so you know when you lose a group of dolphins in the bahamas that you study um it doesn't matter that there are other members of that species elsewhere right. that group that's a specific society with a, their specific cultural trend, uh, traditions. If they go, that whole thing goes. Yeah, it's much like humans, right? Yeah, Tribes exactly. And, uh, cultures, and you know, even like with early whaling, right? Imagine what families were wiped out. I mean, when you start thinking about that, you realize it's the equivalent of genocide. You know, of it really course. is yeah. cultural genocide with these non-humans. And I know it's really unbelievable. Well, let's talk about uh, talking or communication, because some of the most interesting work that you do has to do with trying to decode, if you will, um, the communication system of spotted dolphins and bottlenose dolphins. And um, I know that uh, you have been engaged in some work with uh, Georgia Tech using machine learning uh, to, to try to ans ask the question, is this a language? You talked about that in your presentation. Can you say a little bit more about what are the kinds of things that you're looking for that would tell you that, oh, okay, this is something like a language? Well, I could show you a few diagrams, sure. if you 
like, we'll try the screen That'd sharing. Great. <laughs> Stand by. <laughs> see, see how quick we can get it up this time. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, tell me when hey, you we see, see that. We see that. Okay. Yes. So, um, yeah, so the way we're approaching it is to use the machine learning, various types of machine learning, to ha have the computer help us cluster sound types, right? So the way human speech works is we have phonemes, you know, and then we have morphemes, but we have units of information that we recombine to make words and sentences and so forth. So what we're trying to do is look at these clusters. This is just a, it's an old example uh, from um, Thad Starner's uh, PhD student, Daniel Kohlsdorf, who I work <laughs> with very closely now. Um, and his program basically helps us cluster, you know, F looks like this and I looks like this and so forth. Um, and then what we're trying to do is look at, do these parts form patterns? Is there a sequence? Is A, L, E always found together from these clusters? So we're looking for kind of the smallest units of information. And then what we're really trying to do is say, okay, so every language has structure and order and, uh, you know, behavioral uh, vocalizations could also have some kind of order, but we're, this is the first attempt to look for structure. So we're looking for rules and patterns. So for example, if sound type uh, A always shows up before B or C, this is actually a rule or a formula, followed by A, followed by anything, A to Z, et cetera, et cetera, this becomes a rule that maybe we find these two rules, as you see in the bottom square here, B, G, B, B, et cetera. You know, this would be equivalent of either words or phonemes. And then we're going to look at our, take our metadata, which uh, for us means that we're gonna look at types of behavioral contacts that are happening, what individual dolphins are there, and see if there are patterns that would suggest that this represents uh, some kind of language. Now, it's still gonna be hard to look at in the sense of how do you really determine if you had a sequence of sounds that it meant anything besides, um, i have to stop sharing here, um, that it meant anything besides, hey, come over, there's fish, or you know, there's a fish under the sand here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so really, we might eventually have to do playback if we ever find order and structure to these sounds. So that might be the way we have to really verify if we play back a sequences of sounds in a certain context to see how the animals react. Um, you know, it's probably the only way to really test a language like you would with human mm -hmm. interaction. That's my guess, because you could have all the data you want and order and structure, but what does it really mean to the animals, right? So the, right. the thing the with meaning. language, yeah, meaning. So so when a dolphin is echolocating in the sand and the other dolphin is hearing it, is, is that dolphin hearing just the echoes of the fish underneath the sand, or are they talking about what they had for dinner last night? You know, exactly. we don't know. And exactly. that's a big feature of language, right? That we can abstract and talk about what we did yesterday or plan ahead. Um, that's the big question, right? That's a big aspect. That's the $6 million question. Right, right. exactly, exactly. So, you know, we are developing um, a program. We hope that will be a user interface for other scientists too to put their data sets into so we can help them cluster their sounds and look for mm -hmm. structure. And who knows, maybe there's some universal features to, you know, all these languages that may exist, you know, wouldn't that be cool to find? That would be so, incredible. Yeah, they're great tools. Honestly, I've been waiting my whole life for these tools. <laughs> that, I so. mean, it really is. I mean, com what <laughs> you can do now with machine learning, AI, big data, all that stuff is just phenomenal because it allows you to see things that our brains can't see. Right, right. But it's, you know, it's harder than people understand. It's not, it's not like you magically get an answer out of the computer. You know, there's the, right, exactly. you have to supervise the process, which you inject your expertise. Other times it's unsupervised, you throw it all in and see what comes out. So boy, it's a, it's a process, but you know, we learn as we go. Yes. So that's what science does too. Right? So is, is this something that you uh, think uh, is the kind of approach we can take uh, when we have beluga whales in a sanctuary, for instance, so you know that we have, you know, we're into, we're building a sanctuary on the eastern shore of Nova Scotia with hoping to have several beluga whales there, maybe some orcas as well. And so one of the things that we need to understand is 
How is their communication changing as they adapt to the new environment? Right. And I wonder if some of the techniques you're using could be applied in that way. Yeah, I mean, as far as I understand machine learning, because I'm on a learning curve too, um, yeah, mm -hmm. I think if, if you had baseline of those yeah. belugas or orbits before, you could absolutely throw those data sets in, and you would, if there's a difference, you would see it rather quickly. I mean, it'd be markedly obvious. I mean, the details they have to be flushed out, perhaps, yeah. or if they're, you know, exchanging types of signals they didn't before. But yeah, you would definitely see changes you know what they mean is the mystery right but. <laughs> exactly well you know we have a lot of questions coming up but we can't not talk about dolphin personhood um, because uh, this is something that is uh, has been uh, an idea um, that has been around for a while but uh, philosopher uh, Tom White and you and I have co-authored papers where we talk about personhood. Uh, obviously, there's a legal side to it from what the Non-Human Rights Project is doing and their common law definition of personhood. But it really comes down to knowing whether or not these, these animals have some of the characteristics they're not people, they're not humans, right? That's not what personhood means, but do they have some of the characteristics that you and I have that make us persons? What do you think? Well, I mean, they're alive, they're aware, they have emotions, they have a sense of self. We know that from your work, for example, mm -hmm. and others. Um, we know they have co very complex cognitive abilities. And those are really the short list of what a person is, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to show up at the November 30 election. People mistake personhood for voting rights or something, right? But right. like you said, exactly, you know, exactly. Persons with those characteristics should have the right to a healthy life, to a choice of life, control over their life. I mean, this is, I think, what this definition uh, will do for a non-human species to an extent. I, I agree. I mean, we're talking about species specific needs being met. We're not talking about seeing dolphins or little humans swimming around in the ocean. You know, they are a completely different species, but they can be a non human person if they have certain cognitive characteristics, as you talked about, that, that um, we share with them. And so, you know, I mean, it's, it's not, it's really become sort of a mainstream idea. It's part of the furniture now in terms of philosophical thinking, scientific thinking, legal thinking. Um, and hopefully, you know, at some point, uh, I mean, this is all about dolphins being able to lead a dolphin life, right? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Not, you not know, being, I, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, your sanctuary project is so important. You know, for so many years, we all listen to the, the black and white, right? Like, Either they're in the wild or they're in captivity. It's like, hey, there's a third option, right? Like, mm -hmm. we do this for other species already, right? Gyms and yeah. giraffes. They have a sanctuary. They're given the dignity of life. You know, we can't maybe release them, but we can give them a lot of freedom and a, at least, you know, a decent future rather than. We can do a whole know. lot better for them. Exactly. 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 Right. A whole lot, right. get a lot closer to what they need to thrive. Right. Um, I am going to turn to some questions because we have a bunch of them that came in earlier as well as are coming in now. So I'll sort of go back and forth between them. Um, this, this question uh, is from Anna. Anna asked, you mentioned that uh, paternal lines are tracked through sampling of fecal matter. How many maternal lines are tracked and do you do mitochondrial DNA tracking? Uh, yes, to the last part. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, part of what we do is process mitochondrial DNA, mostly to just verify our observations with the calves. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this was work was done primarily by Michelle Green, who's our geneticist and colleague. Um, and we did have one calf that didn't match her mom. Uh, so 
we suspect it's either an adoption or it could be a software program issue too. Apparently there's some error in some of the okay. software processing. Yes. So we do uh, mitochondrial DNA and then we do micro satellites for the paternity. Correct. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, here's a great question. And this is sort of one of those big questions from Amber, who is working on her PhD in experimental psychology and with an emphasis on animal social behavior. So, right up your alley. And she really wants to understand um, if you have any words of advice for how she could get involved in the kind of work that you do. Like what, what kind of training would she need? Where would she look for potential experiences, internships, opportunities, things of that nature? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I suggest either getting a really basic biology degree, you know, doing the hard stuff, chemistry, mm -hmm. physics, all that, or psychology, depending on your twist. Um, there's tons of opportunities to volunteer uh, around the world. You can get on MarMAM list server, which is a marine mammal list server that has opportunities, and the Society for Marine Mammalogy certainly has job and intern opportunities. And you just have to reach out. I mean, there is nothing more uh, valuable to a field researcher like me. If someone comes along with basic skills, people skills, organizational skills, data collecting skills, data, and yeah, you know, it can be different data. It's not like everybody has to have dolphin experience. The point is, do you have that kind of mind and perseverance? And passion, frankly, is really important. Uh, perseverance and passion goes a long way because it's not easy. I mean, it looks easy. It's you know, our work like, oh, beautiful clear water. It's always nice. No, it's not. There's sharks, there's hurricanes, there's large waves, there's jellyfish. I mean, it goes on and on, right, for any field project. So um, yeah, experience, 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 get the degrees, do the work, find good mentors and good people to study under who are doing what you like, if you can, you know, what you're interested in, because they'll, that'll be the training you get. Yeah, and, and I think that's in uh, that's great. I mean, just to add to that, in any area of science that you think you're attracted to, find a way to get exposed to it. Because it may not be, it may be the best thing that's ever happened, and it's even better than you thought, or it may not be what you thought. <laughs> and, and so the best way to know that before going through eight years of graduate school uh, and a postdoc is to just do it. And right. if you don't like sitting in front of a computer or swimming and trying to catch dolphin poop or whatever the science <laughs> is, then don't do it and do something else that you're passionate about. There you go. Use your skills and your passion together. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's see. Here's a, 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 a question. Um, Okay, this is from Nicole. She asked, I've seen that uh, you guys are beginning to use drones to film animals. Has this been showing promise as a good tool to use in marine mammal research? Absolutely, yes. Many, many, many researchers, of course, have adopted drones. I mean, it gives us the bird's eye view, right? We don't usually have the bird's eye view. Um, yeah, and, um, we have a student, Leah McPherson, who just uh, is off to Hawaii recently for graduate work, who uh, has been using a drone on our boat to track animals when we can't get in the water and follow them and they don't want us in the water. We mm -hmm. put up the drone, follow them, look at, we can look at group coordination. We can even identify individuals with the drone, which is pretty cool if they yes. have a unique markings. Yeah, yeah is, so, yeah. And in the Bahamas, because the habitat is very, uh, very much a contrast, white sand um, and dark dolphin bodies, you can see the habitat they go over, reefs and sand. So this will give us a real ground truthing of where they hang out, you know, when exactly. we're not there. Yeah, and exactly. the other thing we're, we're using is a passive acoustic monitoring where we put down devices that record sounds 24-7. So this is another extreme, you know, one's in the air, one's on the bottom of the sand bank, but they're both collecting data. In the case of sounds, we can leave it set up for a month or two and collect sounds. And, you know, it doesn't give us what's going on visually with the dolphins, but it gives us a sense of when they're around, who's going by, by species. And we can even identify signature whistles in our data, which is pretty cool. <laughs> so these are all really great 
techno tools, of course, that we all love and use. And there's many, many other uses for drones. People yeah. are looking at health measures, pregnancy, I mean, all these things that are really powerful that we haven't had the ability to do well. Right, exactly. And they do, uh, they do adapt to them. I mean, they mm -hmm. obviously, you know, you don't want to just be flying a drone over a group of animals, but, you know, there is an adaptation process as well, correct? Right, right, sure. Yeah, and people have explored and tested, you know, the altitude you want the drone at and, and different things like that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're being careful, and there are rules, right? In the yes, yes. FAA world in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn to a question from somebody who submitted it by email. Uh, and this is from Kathleen. And she asks, and I get this question quite a lot, too. Um, can dolphins uh, intercept each other's echolocation and share experience? Uh, can they share a sense of self by sharing their echolocation in a way that perhaps is even beyond what we know? Um, and this was an idea that has been put forth by Harry Jerison. Um, in his book about, you know, maybe they're so tight, they're so socially cohesive that they actually can see each other's echolocation clicks. I'm not sure about that, but it is a good question. So I wondered if you got asked that question and what you think. Well, I mean, what I know about their echolocation system, and this has been tested, is that, you know, it's about the position of the second animal, right? So we know mm -hmm. from experimental work, so if, uh, where's my hand here? <laughs> you know, if this is a mother dolphin and the calf is under here and the mother is echolocating on something, her clicks are going to bounce off an object mm -hmm. and come back to her. So if the calf is in the right position underneath, the calf is going to get part of that bounce and probably start to learn, well, oh, that echolocation highlight that's coming back represents a fish at this angle or a species. It's kind of what bats do really, right? They, mm -hmm. they get highlight echoes that come back. So it's kind of like us looking at an object and we're seeing photons ref reflecting, right, from an object. And so we yeah. learn what a lamp looks like at different angles because we're seeing it in the light. Mm -hmm. um, so we learn that way uh, too. Yeah, I don't know if they can project those signals back. There's some interesting work called phantom echo work where mm -hmm. experimenters try to fool a dolphin by projecting a th their own echo off an object and seeing mm -hmm. if they can match that echo, and they did. So we think that that's, you know, it's, it's acoustic information that represents to them an object in that case. Now, whether whether they could reproduce a phantom echo themselves, like if they saw a fish, like, taking a Polaroid shot, I guess, and showing <laughs> right? um, whether they can do that and show them what fish they had for dinner last night. I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure how that translates to sense of self. Um, like I suspect they have a lot of emotional information in their sounds, you know, from yeah. prosodic features like rhythm and intensity and like we do, mm -hmm. right? I can't right. really exactly. not really know what's going on, yeah, right? Exactly. Right? Exactly. You no, know, all these things are very communicative. So I suspect it's more that maybe than echolocation, but I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the sense of self, right? Obviously, they have an individual sense of self, right? They right. know that they are one dolphin, and those are the other dolphins. They have that. They are clearly very socially cohesive, but mm -hmm. how that impacts how they view themselves, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's so... It's interesting to think about that in the in the context of mass strandings, for instance, yeah, yeah. Um, and other things. And it's just, you know, it's one of these things that is very difficult to to actually ask them or probe. Well, I, you know, I think they have a sense of their group, like you said, and their coalition, yeah. and their you know, their relationship, their mother and their sibling, and that sort of thing. I mean, I think what's been really interesting for our work also is recognizing that they have strong personalities. And that a group can be quite diverse. You can have 
the aunt who never reproduces being the babysitter and there's like a role for everybody right you have mm. the tomboy females and they might end up reproducing but they're kind of tomboys right they yeah, hang out yeah. With boys, but whatever right and same with the, the the male dolphins you know they have different degrees of boldness and shyness so mm -hmm. personality shows their individual nature quite lovely but it also um coalesces into a society that's healthy yeah. And everyone has their own role to play, depending That's upon right. who they are, what they like, what what they're good at, what they're, just like exactly. us, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I'm going to try to get to just a couple more questions, if you don't mind. So here's a question from uh, Richard, who asks, and I, I think I can answer this, but I'm going to let you answer it. Um, has anyone tried applying mathematics to the language of dolphins? Well, um, I guess yes and no. Uh, yeah, but we don't know if they have a language, first of all, right? So mathematics, I don't know, maybe you should answer it. Maybe you know more than I do. Well, well I mean, there's things like information theory. For, I mean, exactly. There, yeah, exactly. sure, of course. So Lawrence Doyle and, and others have exactly. applied. Um, uh, and 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 that is using statistics and probabilities yeah. and looking at structure in the language. How is that different from the kind of analysis you're doing? Um, well, I think what um, information theory gives you is uh, a sense of the complexity of the language or the mm -hmm. communication. It doesn't really tell you if it's a language or if it has meaning in certain ways. Right. Uh, it, no it content. It does show bab babbling, um, like the beluga work, right? And so we know that mm -hmm. young animals learn, like human babies do, basically. They kind of throw mm -hmm. out a lot of stuff and, 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 again, filter it down till they get words. Um, yeah, so, you know, everything we all do does different things. I think information theory would tell you it's, if it's probably, like, worth looking at, I guess, as a complex language you know as compared yeah. to human languages of course um yeah what we do it's a little more structural looking for actual words sentences patterns rules okay and then hopefully down the road really testing it by maybe playback so yeah a little different but you know different yeah. approaches it could probably be combined which is all critically important to really yeah. get at what is going on and yeah. What their what their communication system is like. Exactly. Um, well, we're just at uh, the at the hour, but I wanted to just round things off by, I mean, first of all, telling you that I could go on and on and talk to you all day. So, but and I get to do that because I can just call you and talk to you. Right. <laughs> but um, we will try to get to some of the questions that haven't been answered uh, because we really appreciate them. Um, Anything you want to leave our audience with in terms of what we need to understand about who dolphins are, and in particular, the dolphins you've been studying for so long? Well, I think like we already mentioned, the idea that they have cultures that are unique and they have needs in the wild that mm -hmm. are really disturbed by humans uh, on so many levels, right? pollution, fishing, noise. I mean, it's all comes down to human activity, really. So every time we have to look at a rule or a policy, we need to be thinking about what these, and not just dolphins, what these ocean creatures need to survive and what, what a healthy ecosystem is for them to live in. Yeah, you can't take the habitat away from the animal, right? So this is why right. we do marine sanctuaries and things like this. We have to have the whole caboodle together for them. It's not just about saving a dolphin, it's about saving the environment they live in and allowing them to have healthy water and healthy fish and not so much noise and all these things. So I guess when people, when they vote or think about policy or encourage laws, they need to be thinking about the big picture and what that means for the survival of not only our dolphins and every dolphin and the planet, but the planet, you know, it's, this is pretty critical. Right. It really makes it really makes a difference. I mean, your behavior makes a difference. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to um, you coming up to Nova Scotia to see yeah. the sanctuary uh, when oh, it's done. 
Um, oh, really cute. looking forward to that. And and again, I can't thank you enough, Denise. It's it's this has been lovely. And thank you everyone for joining in. Um, and we'll try to get to some of the unanswered questions. Uh, if and other than that, be safe. And until next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you.